everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm giving a talk on mapping with drones and open source in a humanitarian <laughs> context. Um, I'm on a small team of geo nerds at the American Red Cross, and we're focused on working internationally with other Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. We support disaster resilience, response, and recovery programs, helping to create, store, and use data to increase the efficiency and impact of our work. Um, because of our backgrounds, we tend to have a bias towards geospatial data and interesting tech. And recently, we've become interested in drones. Um, I think drones are pretty cool tech and potentially very useful. The Red Cross uh, is just starting to explore the humanitarian use of drones. Um, there are a lot of groups like We Robotics and You Aviators uh, that have been doing great work in the field for a long time now. There are also major institutions involved. Um, one example, the government of Malawi and UNICEF recently partnered to launch Africa's first uh, air corridor to test the use of drones in humanitarian missions. Uh, one study found that humanitarians are overwhelmingly uh, positive about drones, uh, with some of the top categories of use cases being mapping, monitoring, and search and rescue. Um, I'm into GIS, and so I want to map with drones. Uh, there are examples of drones being used for humanitarian mapping. Uh, as far back as 2012, uh, they were used in post-earthquake um, Haiti uh, to support a census. In 2015, uh, there was a major effort in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania uh, for flood disaster risk reduction efforts where they mapped large portions of the city. Uh, 2015 also saw small-scale mapping post-earthquake post in Nepal and damage assessments in Vanuatu, a Pacific Island nation that was devastated by a typhoon. Uh, there's also examples of drones uh, being used to collect imagery for displaced persons camp management. Uh, why drone imagery? A drone can be launched on short notice, uh, for instance, to take advantage of breaks in inclement weather. Uh, the direct cost of successful flight, assuming there's no accidents and after you've invested in the initial hardware, is minimal. You might need to char charge some batteries and there might be some operational wear on the equipment, but otherwise pretty cheap. Uh, Drones are less likely to be affected by atmospheric conditions such as cloud cover, uh, and it's feasible to collect repeat imagery of an area over short time intervals. The resolution and overall quality of the imagery collected by a drone can be much higher than some other platforms. Um, there are trade-offs in how much area can be covered, but there are a lot of benefits. Uh, up on the screen is just an example of some satellite imagery and then some drone imagery I was able to collect in the Philippines. And you can see uh, around the water body to the top, there's been a lot of development. And there's features that you can pick out in the drone imagery that simply aren't visible in the satellite imagery. The American Red Cross got to pilot our use of drones for mapping in the Philippines earlier this year. Um, alongside the Philippine Red Cross, we've been running a multi-year uh, recovery program in Leyte, Philippines, in response to the, the, the sorry, in response to the devastation uh, wreaked by Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda that hit in November of 2013. Uh, in May, I was able to go there and lead activities using drones to map 23 of the different uh, project sites where we've been working. So what did we do? Uh, we took a lot of pictures. Ended up mostly using two DJI Matic Pros, which wasn't ideal and wasn't our original plan, but um, ended up helping us accomplish what we set out to do. Uh, you need a ton of pictures because you need overlap between each picture taken along a pass and then also side lap between each pass of the drone as it covers a project area. Um, features on the ground need to show up in multiple pictures. Uh, it needs to show up in multiple pictures and then you set some algorithms and code loose on it and you get cool outputs like geotiffs and digital surface models. These derived products are way more useful than the individual pictures. And thanks to amazing open source products like Open Drone Map, uh, a number of people on that team are in the room. I find them and thank them for me. I thank them a lot. Um, we can create these products without having to pay thousands of dollars in licensing fees, which is really important for a nonprofit. Um, so then what do we do next? We opened it up. Uh, another open platform, Open Aerial Map, is a great platform for easily sharing and discovering open imagery. So we uploaded all of the 23 areas to Open Aerial Map so that others could access the products that we had created. Uh, we're huge fans of OpenStreetMap at the Red Cross. Uh, it's our go-to for spatial information when we're responding to a disaster. Uh, an open aerial map uh, lets us load our imagery into the editors for OpenStreetMap and use it to trace features and update the map. Uh, we also engage the crowd. Uh, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team tasking manager lets you grid up an area of interest so that digital volunteers can collaborate effectively in updating an area of the map. And we use this to, to invite people to help us trace the project areas. 
Here's one of the areas after being traced using only satellite imagery. Uh, it looks like there's not that many people living there, uh, but after collecting drone imagery and using that to update the map, we can see that there actually is quite a lot there. And with this much more detailed information, it becomes much easier to, to plan and respond to disasters. This is one of the maps used by local government uh, for planning purposes in the Philippines. There's a lot of information there, but it's not particularly geographically accurate. Uh, talking with community leaders during the activities, they were super excited about having more accurate maps. NGOs that come to the area to do work often ask about maps and tend to dis be disappointed with kind of the hand-drawn offerings that are par for the course. Uh, also, the local officials have to update these maps yearly, and it's a difficult process for them to do based on memory and just using a piece of paper and pencil. Maps are awesome for other reasons. Um, with accurate base maps, you can collect additional data for more advanced analyses. Uh, this is an area of Zimbabwe where we supported a mapping project. Uh, in addition to data like addresses, we helped people collect information on structure type and perceived condition. Concrete and poor quality seemed to correlate, and then after conversations with the locals, it was revealed that those were older government-built structures. The data was supported by anecdotal evidence, all of which provided guidance when targeting uh, programs in the area. NGOs tend to be resource constrained, and so effective allocation of resources is important. Uh, good maps also help in disaster response. In a major response, we'll have actors from other parts of the country as well as from around the world. They need to know place names, where people live, where critical infrastructure is located, and how to get around. So maps are super important for disaster preparedness and response as well. Um, on a side note, uh, we also collected imagery for upload to Mapillary and OpenStreetCam using Sony action cameras and LG360 cameras. Uh, this is me hiding from the sun under a Red Cross umbrella as we captured imagery walking down a road. And so all of this contributing to an awesome amount of data that can be used to really understand what's there, what's on the ground. Um, everything is up on the web, so go check it out. Uh, it's pretty amazing when you can go in and see a pile of gravel in the uh, aerial imagery and then also in the, the street level imagery side by side. Um, so a quick summary of the presentation so far. Uh, we love spatial data. Uh, drone imagery is beautiful and also helps create awesome spatial data. Um, but I don't have the money for a fleet of drones and I haven't been able to convince anyone to give me a fleet of drones. Uh, so what are my options? Uh, well, I think I can do it myself. Um, for our mapping purposes, we need buildings in the right place, but not centimeter grade accuracy for engineering purposes or anything. So DIY seems to kind of fit the bill for this and other reasons. There's a ton of stuff on the internet. Uh, some of it's horrifying, some of it's wrong, and th but there's plenty of useful resources if you just know where to look. Um, a lot of the tech is pretty cheap and increasingly easily available, um, and it, it just has to work. Uh, Patrick Meyer is a big name in the humanitarian drone realm, and he is a great example of a team that successfully used a repurposed drone, originally costing less than $3,000, less than $3, and held together by duct tape at the time uh, to successfully deliver, deliver medical cargo in the Amazon. Uh, this was side by side when they also had a $40,000 drone and the support staff from that company selling that drone, uh, which failed to do the same mission. Uh, so it doesn't have to be shiny or expensive, but it does have to work. Uh, flying can be hard. Uh, if you built it yourself, it's easier to practice flying. Uh, rebuilding an airframe constructed from Dollar Tree foam board uh, is a lot easier than sending in a multi-thousand dollar drone for repairs by the company. And being able to control your drone manually is an important skill for emergency situations or in the event something goes wrong with a planned mission. So being able to practice uh, is a nice uh, side effect of doing it yourself. Um, flying skill is also important uh, for being able to take off and land in challenging environments. This is our practice field outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, when we went to the Philippines to map, there were no giant fields of recently mown grass for us to land in. Um, who would have thought, you know? Uh, so conditions are never going to be this ideal, and you should be able to operate manually in challenging environments. If you only have, you know, a several thousand or, you know, twelve, twenty thousand dollar drone, you're probably not practicing with it that often. Um, if you've built a drone yourself, it becomes easier to troubleshoot in situations where it may not be practical or even possible to get customer service support from the vendor. Um, quick repairs may be possible, resulting in delays rather than permanent groundings. Uh, Did you get permission for that image? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, when operating uh, away from a support infrastructure and systems. Uh, so how did we start out at the Red Cross? 
Uh, the FAA recently, sort of recently released part one of seven regulations, which allowed organizations to have certified pilots after only a test and not requiring remote certified pilots to have first been certified uh, for manned aircraft. So a colleague and I got our remote pilot licenses um, and we learned a bit on an Event 38 uh, E384 pictured here and also a tough wing mapper, the black flying wing in the picture from the practice field. Both are mid-range in terms of cost, um, but paying for a company to do all the hard work meant that we didn't really understand them and ended up calling and emailing a lot when things didn't work. The companies were great, uh, don't get me wrong, but we like to roll things ourselves whenever possible. Uh, on a personal level, I started out with foamies, so simple RC aircraft uh, built out of Dollar Tree foam board. Uh, there's a ton of great resources online in the whole community. There's an awesome organization group company called Flight Test uh, that has complete designs and you can also buy equipment from them to get a faster start. Uh, and I built a couple of their simple models and my ambitions quickly expanded from there. Um, I wanted to carry a little bit more, like the camera and other electronics used for mapping. Uh, and open source to the rescue again. RG Pilot is an awesome open source uh, system with the community behind it uh, for automated robotics. Um, but I still needed a physical thing for the software to control. My initial thoughts on airframe construction were to sandwich the electronics between protective layers of polycarbonate sheets held apart by screws. Um, it seems sturdy and like a good way to protect the electronics. Uh, I destroyed this airframe uh, several times over trying to get it to work. Uh, luckily didn't destroy any electronics, although one of the attempts did go down in some woods and I found the main fuselage but not the tail, so I did lose the small motors on the tail one time. Um, this, in this attempt, it looked pretty good on the ground, but it simply was too heavy and not aerodynamic enough. Um, one attempt at overcoming that issue was simply to slap a bigger motor on it. Um, I probably could have asked uh, someone with some engineering knowledge and they would have told me that was silly uh, and I could have saved some time, effort and cash, uh, but I didn't and uh, had some more uh, error in my trials. Um, a couple of iterations of both that and a different uh, airframe type uh, proves fruitless. Um, just because it looks like a plane doesn't mean it will fly like a plane. <laughs> uh, downtrodden, but not void of all hope, I returned to the internet and found Ed and his YouTube channel, Experimental Airlines. He's designed a foam board airframe dubbed the Ansley Pistrum, and one of his videos he describes a version that pushed uh, two kilograms of total weight, um, which was definitely enough for what I wanted to carry in terms of the camera and flight electronics. Um, so I watched all of his videos, there's a lot of them, and built a variation. Uh, this is my version. Uh, the camera is in the, the front, off to the left there, um, which I didn't fly with the camera. I had a small cardboard box weighted with quarters to be the equivalent weight, um, so that if I crashed, I wouldn't damage anything expensive, uh, followed by the battery and then the Pixhawk flight controller and associated electronics towards the back, towards the motor. Um, everything for the drone, minus the laptop for the ground control station, came in at just around $1,000, and that's including the, the various tools and other things. And the body of it itself being by far the cheapest part of that. The entire airframe is built out of sheets of uh, Dollar Tree foam board, which cost a dollar since they're from the Dollar Tree. Yeah. Um, so what's next? Uh, I still need to improve and refine the airframe a bit and want to build out my documentation the process. I put all of my stuff up online, uh, but definitely needs to be uh, fleshed out some more. Right now, the camera is also sideways in the drone, and I want it to be oriented to the flight path so that more ground to either side of the drone is captured and passes can be spaced further apart uh, while still achieving good side lab for image stitching. Um, and right now, although I'm focused on this fixed wing design, it doesn't mean I won't look at quadcopters um, in the future or maybe uh, VTOL vertical takeoff and landing designs, uh, which would be useful in areas where you can't find those large fields to take off and land in. Uh, but one thing at a time. Um, we're looking at better ways of processing in the field. Uh, this is an Intel NUC with 32 gigs of RAM, and we're looking at ways uh, to, especially once uh, Open Drone Map rolls out some of the improvements for scaling, uh, to process quickly in the field. Uh, you know, what would it take to collect large amounts of imagery post-disaster, process it locally, and make the products available just a few hours later? Uh, I also want to explore more accurate georeferencing. Uh, as part of this uh, experiment, I came up with 12 uh, unique 
uh, designs and borrowed a sewing machine and spent way too much time making meter by meter flags that could be laid out during imagery collection as ground control points. Uh, ground control points being identifiable features in your imagery, which you can then uh, collect more accurate coordinates for and use to improve the, the georeferencing of your outputs. Uh, so we use these um, and the waypoint averaging function of a Garmin GPS 62 handheld, and it did uh, help improve the accuracy of some of our outputs, uh, but I'd love to explore more, more robust GPS hardware and other method, methods of improving the, the georeferencing. Um, so again, yeah, I put all my resources and experiences up on GitHub, um, so hopefully others can tell me what I'm doing wrong, uh, what worked for them, and other things. Uh, also, when I get something working or fail particularly spectacularly, I tend to tweet about it, so you can uh, keep up on my adventures there. Um, and yeah, um, exciting uh, opportunities. Um, it'll be interesting to see as regulations develop and as more people kind of explore the field uh, where this goes. Um, and just a note of like, beyond the, the geospatial outputs, just the, the visual um, effect of aerial imagery and some of the stories you can tell. Uh, so the Philippine Red Cross, when they were uh, helping to rebuild in Leyte, uh, used red uh, corrugated iron sheets for the roofing materials that they gave to people to rebuild their houses and also for the homes that they constructed. And so in all of the imagery, that we collected, you can see each house that the Philippine Red Cross reached with their recovery efforts by the Red Roofs. And so in this particular village, almost, almost every single house benefited from the recovery programs that the Red Cross ran in that area. And when communicating the impact of the programs, that's like a, that's a powerful, powerful visual image. Um, so yeah, that uh, kind of wraps up what I had to say and would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. The DJI, um, a few small glitches with like the applications, but I guess nothing that wouldn't, you'd also have glitches with Mission Planner and the open source. Um, the field of vision of like the small uh, cameras that they carry, um, I would love to have like a quadcopter that carried something closer to like a QX1 Sony like digital camera with just a wider field of vision, higher resolution. Um, open drone map, uh, or any image processing works faster if you have fewer images, and with a camera with a larger field of vision, you end up with fewer images at the end. Um, just efficiency. Excellent. Thank you. I know it's kind of an expensive sensor, but like the Paris Sequoia, it has multi-spectral at the same time, and a rather crappy RGB. But with the multi-spectral, do you think that might help you with the mapping? Because in certain banquets, the ECFC something? Yeah, so our initial use case is just kind of the basic uh, base mapping but definitely looking at other possible uses. Um, so for the base mapping, like I was talking to a guy who does shelter recovery, and it would be useful to fly an area, you know, once a week after disaster to find out um, how quickly people are self-recovering, so whether or not there is a need or a gap um, by counting the number of houses that still have damaged roofs, the ones with, you know, tarps, the ones with tarps that you know have been given out by the UN because they're blue, and houses that have actually like repaired their structures and stuff like that. Um, and then also for recovery programs, if we're doing um, like uh, the livelihood in agriculture, uh, being able to know how badly fields were damaged, um, whether or not uh, you know plantations would cover uh, or orchards and stuff like that. So there would be uses for like a vegetation NDC. Um, what was it called? Um, drone deploy was the one we used mostly. Uh, of the ones we were testing out, um, it was the one that like worked. We got to work most quickly, and so just kind of stuck with that and didn't have time to experiment. Um, Longer flight times, larger area covered. Um, I, with the DJI's, we had like eight flight batteries and just up and down constantly for all day. It just got tiring. Um, it'd be nice to cover area a little bit faster. Um, 
of course, then you have to have like the landing and takeoff spots. Um, so some, I think a VTOL would be amazing, uh, like, like the best of both. Um, I briefly looked at kites. Um, so what? Delta style. Oh, Delta style. Sorry, uh, like the flying flying wing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, for the do it yourself, it seems a little bit harder to get like the center of gravity correct, and also to fit all the electronics in. Um, definitely, one of the ones we were first the purchased ones we first were using was a a Delta flying wing style. Um, Um, so like there's a flight test was a big one, especially when first understanding kind of like the basics of just building something that goes through the air. Um, a number of uh, YouTube just is a u useful resource, especially this guy with his uh, experimental airlines channel. Um, RG Pilot has excellent documentation. Some of it's a little bit um, disorganized, but if you dig and read enough, like it's there. Um, and like the forums too, the, uh, you just got to dig through forums and kind of judge based on the response whether or not you should listen to what they're saying. Um, but but it, there's a lot there. So um, like there's a just an RC flying club that's 45 minutes out in Rockville, Maryland. Um, so we, we drive out there, our, mem our members. Uh, I think throughout the U.S., there's a fair number of like RC flying clubs that most are fairly uh, open to having people practice with drones. There's what like beyond <laughs> RC aircrafts, drones with autonomous flight functionality and stuff like that. You just have to talk to them beforehand. Yeah, definitely. Um, the tough wing, when we did it, we did it buying like the pieces and putting it together, and that was super helpful in better understanding, like what did what. Um, and the documentation has gotten better. Like I think when we did it, it didn't mention the um, like the safety switch trigger, like installing that. So I I didn't put it in and couldn't figure out why I couldn't get my my drone to arm. Um, and so like. But I, that's gotten better. Um, yeah, tough. The tough one was great. Uh, we really liked that one. I apologize um, if you haven't been able to hear. This was about the UN and their use of drones. I'm not really familiar uh, beyond like UNICEF and the partnership with the government of Malawi. Um, and I know that the UN actually as far back as like 2014 was when they published their first kind of position-ish paper or whatever, they, a paper like about the use of drones in humanitarian uh, situations. Um, but not, I'm not familiar with their activities. Yeah, I would definitely, he was asking about partnering with uh, engineering students, uh, and yeah, I would definitely be open to, to learning uh, from them or having like a, somebody actually do like a some final project to um, refine them or just a design for us. Um, there was a cool, recently, 
the University of the Netherlands, a group uh, made like a 3D printed drone um, and then made it open for people. Uh, so that was a, a neat initiative. Uh, they were partnering with uh, MSF to do that. How do you prepare the local population for you flying with the drone? Is there a certain standard for saying, you know, I'm doing peaceful stuff? Or? So in the Philippines, we went through all the, the government uh, regulations to get the proper permits and everything and had com communications with both the provincial, municipal, municipal and barangay, which is the lowest level government uh, officials. Um, and we've been working in the areas for more than two years now. Um, so have existing relationships with those communities. Um, in other areas, it would be it would be context specific. Uh, certain parts of Africa, like there's a lot of confusion or stigma around drones. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, there's lots of people flying them recreationally, uh, so it's already a technology they're familiar with. I, I think we're out of time, but I'll be more than happy to talk with you uh, on the side or after. Thank you.